I'm so honored to be with this group. I really wish I could have been here all day long. I've heard amazing things. In fact, I think it's been so amazing for some people that a couple of people were just mentally and, and emotionally exhausted in a positive way. I, a couple of people were like, I think I gotta duck out because I can't handle any more inspiration. Um, so for those of you that have stayed, congratulations for making it through. Hopefully this will be energizing. Um, and I'm so excited, first of all, that there's like tape on the stage and there were instructions for speakers to stay within the box. And so I'm just so excited to completely disregard all of those ideas and just be myself. Um, so, um, also raise your hand if you've heard me talk before. A couple of you guys, yeah. So my apologies to all of you because 90% about what you're, you're gonna hear is exactly what you've heard me share before. Um, it's been such an intense year doing lots of incredible work that I, sometimes it's hard to pause and actually update your story, but I do have a little bit of gems if we have time to talk about what I've been doing at a 324-year-old British bank, which has been pretty amazing. So I, to me, the whole focus of this gathering is about collaborative models of kind of organizational innovation and how do how does a purpose-driven and values-led teams and organizations work together? And I actually want to talk about what I think is a precursor to that working well, which is about creativity. Because if we don't have a fundamental recognition of people's innate creati creativity, there's really no reason to collaborate. Because the model of the myth of the expert will prevail. And why collaborate with folks when you know, we can just hire someone who's amazing, or I'm the amazing one, I don't need to talk to you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit around creativity, and as a designer, I think you've done already a little bit, you've gotten warmed up with visual exploration with Paul, so hopefully this will be a, con a continuation of that. But so, so as a designer, you know, my goal in life is to create moments of joy and impact for people. And you can imagine, a year ago when I came to Lloyd's Banking Group, I am now having to reconcile the statement that in addition to being a designer, I am also now a banker. <laughs> and banking isn't known for bringing moments of joy and delight into people's lives, right? In fact, when I actually made my first move into banking back in Capital One, I got this tweet from someone that said, McCoskey, why work for a bank? That won't bring positive change. <laughs> and there were a couple of folks in my LinkedIn network who sent me some DMs because you know I was at Google and at Microsoft and at Walmart.com and, and I come to this British bank and some people were like, yo, you okay, bro? <laughs> like everything all right? Because from the outside world, coming to work for a British bank when you're into tech and into design is not really an advancement, right? It's like something's wrong. And it's interesting because there are some things that confirm this notion. You know, how many of you guys use Google to search? Yeah, we all use it, right? And, you know, when you guys type in a term, Google has this really cool feature called autocomplete, where they take the most relevant terms that actual people are searching for and try to shortcut you really quickly to your search results. So when I was thinking about coming to a bank for the first time, I was at Google, and I did a couple of Google searches just to kind of understand a little bit of the landscape. So check this search out. I don't know if you can read back there, but these are the autocomplete results for finances are. For those in the back, here's the list. Finances are, and these are the actual most top terms that people search on. Finances are ruining my marriage. Finances are stressing me out. Finances are a mess. Finances are tight. Finances are out of control. And to me as a designer, I felt what better place to bring the designer's sense of empathy and creativity to, then to the, the world of finances because clearly human beings and money have a huge disconnect. Be, working here for the last year, I have never seen so many tears in talking to our customers and when we do ethnographic research, we bring them in and we kind of test prototypes. The amount of guilt and shame and anxiety and fear and worry in this thing called money is really deep. And if you look at the statistics, so these are for the UK. 40% of UK adults are dealing with pretty significant financial stress at any time, right? So almost half of this room right now 
is dealing with money worries. That's 120 billion of productivity loss in the UK alone, not even counting up all the therapy, therapy bills and all the other knock-on effects. And I think even you know, from a much more human, gut-wrenchingly personal perspective, it's the number one cited cause of divorce and it's a, it's a serious complication in, in many suicides. So to me, I'm working in an industry that is like really excited about hashtag FinTech. And I, get just, I came from this conference uh, yesterday, or two days ago, called Cybos, 10,000 people, all in London. And it's all about blockchain and distributed le ledgers and like the power of APIs and cloud storage. And like the financial world is like geeking out hardcore about hashtag FinTech. And I like tech, but I don't feel like this is the most important problem to solve. I actually, I don't know, this, this hashtag is not as creative. How many of you guys are in branding and marketing? Anyone out there? Maybe you guys can help me with this a little bit. I mean, so I, to me, hashtag FinSense, I, we need to help ordinary human beings just understand the role of money in their lives and how to connect them to it in really healthy ways. And working for a 324-year-old British bank, where you go to the ninth floor of 25 Gresham in London, the headquarters, and there's like oil paintings of all the chairmen gone past, and you're just like, I don't even own a suit, and I go to that, you know, that building almost every week, and I have deep imposter syndrome because I do not feel like I belong <laughs> at all. Um, you know, there's this model of innovation that says you have to look at three, these three factors of innovation, right? So business factors of innovation is all about viability, like how to create a sustainable organization from a financial perspective. Technology is all about feasibility, like what can we do? And this is where often Silicon Valley geeks out on, you know, their, all of their capabilities. But this is a really important area, human factors of innovation, which is all about desirability. And when we think about creating organizations that are collaborative, creating organizations that respect the innate creativity in human beings, this is the one we forget about. And this is the one I'm trying to represent across Lloyd's banking group, and it's sometimes really hard. Because the reality is the middle of this place is where beauty lies. Now, I would actually say for this conference, I don't normally do this kind of in a business sense, but I would say there's spiritual factors of innovation as well, which is really around meaning and purpose. And, um, but you can kind of get at that a little bit with the human factors, right? Because this is a little bit more into the, our deeper world. So to get into that zone, and hopefully Paul has done his job in getting you guys ready, there won't be too many boos at this moment, I actually want to do a quick drawing activity with this group. <laughs> First of all, raise your hand if you think you're, you're creative, you're a creative kind of professional or person. Yeah, great. Okay, a couple of you guys. I got some, some people are like, I don't know, maybe a little bit. I'm not sure. Okay, so what I want you to do is get a blank sheet of paper and get a pen, and I'm going to have you do a very quick drawing activity. I promise it'll be over soon. We're, it's only going to be 60 seconds. Everyone have a piece of paper, something to draw with? Piece of paper, something to draw with? Everybody? Okay. So here's what I want you to do. So at your table, what I want you to do is look at the person to your left around your table. <laughs> So, so, you'll look, do each other. You'll do each other. You'll do each other. Okay, everybody? Okay, now in 60 seconds, this is very simple. What I want you to do is draw them. What you guys just accomplished actually was a creativity experiment that was done by this Stanford engineering professor whose name was Bob McKim. And Bob, so, you know, this is Bob. And as a Stanford engineering professor in the 60s and 70s, you know, engineering is very left-brained. It's very rational, linear, work breakdown structure kind of approach. But he noticed some of his students were particularly kind of design-oriented and creative. And they would often break the rules. They wouldn't stay right within the tape box. And they would take approaches that seemed like they shouldn't work, but often they would work in unexpected ways. So he started studying this thing called creativity. Now, he did this activity hundreds of times with all different types of people. Every time he did this activity with adults, 
this is exactly what would happen. Lots and lots of sorries. <laughs> like, I heard probably seven oh gods <laughs> as I was walking through, which I'd expect from an EBBF crowd. So it's good <laughs> calling on the divine. Um, I think I might have, I'm not going to call it any individuals, but I think I heard a, I apologize in advance. <laughs> like, I haven't even started, but I know I'm going to suck. And I'm sorry, right? Now, whenever Bob McKim did this activity with children, particularly kids under kind of, you know, middle school, like in elementary years, they have a very different response. Who here has kids? Okay. What do you think happens when kids do this activity? Yeah, actually, they don't particularly love it, and they don't particularly fear it. They just kind of do it. it. They're neutral about it. Like for those that have kids, you know, what happens when you put down crayons and paper next to a child? What do they do? They go for it, right? Sometimes you don't need even need paper, just a white wall. Just they'll go for it. And so Bob McCam did this activity to prove that human beings innately are creative and we are expressive. But something happens in those middle school years, and those of you that have seen the most watched TED Talk of all time about does, do schools kill creativity, will know that somehow the educational system that we have, which is kind of born out of the industrial era, right, where instead of bringing out people's innate creativity, the educational system is really much more about let's manufacture knowledge student by student and grade it and box it and certify it. And somehow in that system, we start to fear the judgment of our peers because there's this thing called the right way to do things. And so if you remember one thing from this talk, you cannot collaborate in this mindset. The only way to collaborate is if you trust and believe in your colleagues and your customers and the world's innate creativity. Because if it isn't there, then all we're doing is just following some mythical standard that we've created. Now, there's a book about this, which I love, called Creative Confidence, which was written by the Kelly brothers, who co-founders of IDEO, the world's most admired design firm. And they mentored under Bob McKim. And they wrote this book about how to exercise that, in it, that, that deep muscle. And it's not just for designers. It's for everybody. Um, and there's all different ways to build creative confidence. But one of the most important ways is, or one of the, one of the variables where you know you're building creative confidence is to get out of your comfort zone. It's not to hold back when you have a crazy idea or when you have a crazy doodle or you have something that is just welling up from inside that you, you know, getting, getting rid of the fear of judgment is common. So the way that I do it is two or three times a week I try to get into Pineapple Studios here in Covent Garden and I go to a hip hop dance class because that is not where I belong. It's uncomfortable for a 45 year old white dude from the US to like go. <laughs> to that kind of class. And so to me, it's like, this is the way that I can start to deal with that uncomfortability. And it was horrifyingly scary at first. Like, I don't know, some of the guys back there are like, holy shit, like I would never do that. Excuse my language. But as soon as I just rid myself of thinking about what other people thought about me and I just lived in the moment, it was transformative. And I look forward to this all the time now. It's really pretty amazing. <laughs> I was thinking of trying to bring one of the hip hop instructors from Pineapple Studios to hang out with you guys and actually do a little hip hop class right here, but I'm kind of glad I didn't because it's already really sweaty and we're not even, we're just sitting down. <laughs> but so, you know, when we think about, you know, dance, so this is actually a younger version of myself. I went to the Maxwell International Baha'i School and we started a dance workshop there. And uh, this uh, other person next to me, this is Risa, and uh, she actually is now my wife, and we have a family together. Um, and when I was leaving Maxwell and going to university, first of all, I said, I'm not ready for university. I did two gap years. I was a gardener in Israel for a year where I met Tahere. She had a cushy job up in the like administrative offices, and I was out there sweating on Mount Carmel, just like dripping. Um, and I spent uh, six months in West Africa doing social and economic development through the performing arts. And when I did go to school, I decided to go to Tufts University because they were awesome at international relations. It was also within marriageable distance of Risa, who was at Wellesley, and I couldn't go there because it's a women's college. So I didn't tell my parents that, but that was the plan. And I 
going into university said, I'm going to do anything but design. Because I love my dad, but he's a designer. And when you're 19, even if you don't have deep daddy issues, I think you're wired to just rebel and do your own thing. But it all changed when I realized that Tufts had a sister school at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And, and I decided to become a designer because a whole new generation of digital tools was coming out. And my dad was doing, like Paul was talking about, he was doing corporate identities and rub down type physics. I mean, he didn't actually know how to use computers that well. And I, this was a new world for me. But you know, design is kind of self-centered. The stereotype of the designer is this kind of Steve Jobs, Johnny Ive, black troll neck kind of artists. Kind of like, I know best. And the reality is, it took me a long time to realize the opposite is true. That quote about um, design is most powerful when it's an act of humble service. I remember someone read that in my profile and they like sent me a, like, a tweet and they were like, ha, 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 for like 20 you know, lines. <laughs> Because that's not how people think about design. And they, think, they thought I was like ridiculous for saying it. But, and, and actually check this out. So Johnny Ive himself, the chief design officer, or former chief design officer at Apple, he made this statement when, you know, because Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive are kind of famous for saying, you know, people don't know what they want, you know, and, uh, you know, and Henry Ford is kind of famous for saying, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, not cars. And all of that's a little bit of a myth. But he said, it's unfair to ask people who don't have a sense of the opportunities of tomorrow from the context of today to design. This kind of reinforces that myth of the expert, the myth of the genius, the myth that we're not all creative. And in this model, you hire experts to do the great work. And I was working on a project for United Airlines, and I had this kind of idea in my head, and I had just gotten this new title as a designer working with tech, we were called experience designers. And I thought that was the most badass title you could have, right? Because I don't design websites, I design experiences. It just felt powerful, it felt great. I was very black turtleneck kind of thinking. And we were working on this project for United for their website and these really weird people that I had never met before called design researchers. Any of you guys in the design research world? Any of you anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, any of those? Yeah, there's this whole world of people that are really good at understanding people and behavior. They were on our team and they brought in these people and they did this thing called paper prototyping where over the course of a week they had a couple of dozen people and they went through a creative activity with a blank browser window and said, you know, what would you want to see on the ideal united.com? And if you, if you subscribe to the Johnny Ive notion, it's unfair to ask people what tomorrow should be because they don't really know what they're talking about. To me, I was a little bit upset that they were doing this because I get paid $350 an hour at this consultancy to answer that question. And you know, people don't know what they want. But then over the course of 18 months of this massive hundreds of thousands of pages website, the insights from that week ended up solving the most complicated interaction and information design problems that I kind of was humbled. It was the first moment that I realized that design is not all about the expert. So I took those guys out to lunch, the researchers, those funny people that were like anthropologists, like what the heck is that doing? And I, I took them out to lunch and I said, what is this? There's something, there's something powerful there, tell me more. And they introduced me to all kinds of stuff. One was the work of Dr. Elizabeth Sanders. And um, I'm, I'm actually, she's my hero in design and I've actually brought her into my teams. This is us when she, I was at Walmart and she's helped kind of connect us to uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, but initially, when I had kind of connected with her, I was unhappy. Because you remember, I had just taken this title as Dan McCoskey, experienced designer. And I read one of her papers. And on that paper, she said this. <laughs> and I was like, heck no. <laughs> you know? Um, but I went into it, and she, and she actually talked about, well, what is an experience? What is, what is an experience at its fundamental unit? And she says it's actually a moment in time. It's the present, which is at the intersection of our memories of the past and our dreams of the future. And it's actually a pretty sacred thing that is internal. You know, how many of you guys still use Facebook? My kids don't, like, so clearly we're, we're of a bit of an older generation. But like on Facebook, how many of you guys have seen this thing like two years ago, you were doing this thing, right? Have you guys seen that? Like, I don't really check that out much, but when I do, I, rec I feel that I, I get new insights into those moments from the past. 
And to me, it's just a, it's a symbol of how inaccessible sometimes our own moments are to ourselves. We can barely understand the meaning and purpose of the, our, our own experiences. So what Liz was saying is, you can't design that. Experiencing is in people. The best that we can do is to design for experience. And it kind of put that, that three letter word for completely changed my life as a designer. And what I'm gonna show you now are two projects that are still in the commercial space, but I, I wanted to show you my attempts, my humble attempts to try to live that, that word for, where design is in service of people's experience. So the other thing that she says is that in order to design for those experiences, you have to engage people. And there's only three ways to understand human beings, according to Liz. She says it's what people say, what they do, and what they make. What people say is 90% of you know, traditional market research. It's surveys, it's focus groups, it's interviews, it's annoying people calling you up and saying, what do you think about blah, blah, blah. And, um, and for any of you who have teenagers, you know that human beings, often what they say is not exactly what they do. <laughs> um, and even if well-intentioned people want to give you the right answer, there's just often a gap. Like if I said, you know, tell me how you drive, Oscar. Like you'll do your best to say, well, I think what I do is I get in and then I do a mirror and then I adjust and then I, you know. But if I actually sat next to you and I just observed, what do you actually do? You'd probably do things that you don't even recognize that you do, right? Or aren't comfortable talking about, like, oh, I start driving and then I set the navigation, which is highly unsafe, but I'm not gonna tell you that because my subconscious is telling me that that's not cool, right? Now, what Liz says is, these two are good, but the, the best part to understand people is what people make, what people create. And if we're all innately creative, this is, and actually she has this model, which is really interesting, where um, this is kind of hard to see it in the back, but basically there's the surface understanding and then there's a deep understanding. And if you think about what people say, what they think, what they do, what they use, what they know, what they feel, and what they dream. This is the deep, deeper spiritual bits. We want to get to what people dream. We want to get to what people feel. That's where real innovation lies when it comes to building communities, organizations, families, relationships of purpose, is getting into this space. And the kind of knowledge that we get is deeper, right? So there's explicit knowledge about what people say and think. There's observable knowledge, which is a deeper level of knowledge. Then there's this, this place called tacit knowledge, which is kind of just below what I'm, I can talk about. And then the really good stuff is latent knowledge. That's the stuff I don't even know how to talk about, but is like, cool, right? So if I had a conversation with my 20-year-old son, Max, and said, you know, tell me, how do you feel about your relationship with God? I, it's kind of hard to like understand it here, but there's something there, right? What Liz says is the only way to get to that tacit knowledge, to that latent knowledge, is to involve people in generative sessions where they can actually start to engage with the future. And this is an example of the kind of toolkits that she uses to do that. So this is a project for Microsoft. It's actually around a game controller, which isn't the most purposeful thing. But think about this from a collaboration perspective. You got Microsoft, you got expert industrial designers, business leaders, and normally they'll just design a controller in their studios by themselves. But what Liz says is no, you gotta involve these people in it. These are the people that are, are representing the users, the people that are gonna use it. And they are, from a sociological perspective, they are in their native habitats, their home. <laughs> They're not coming to your like artificial focus groups or some research center. The researchers go to them. And, and this is a father and son, and they have what's called ambiguous stimuli. These are kind of uh, felt covered shapes with Velcro buttons. And these, these folks can use this kit as props to tell stories about their ideal gaming experiences, father and son in the future. And this is kind of weird stuff from a design perspective, because normally we work in the world of craft. So let me give you one example of wh what this looks like, and let me show you what we did. Actually, it was at Motorola. Um, this was about six years ago. We were actually designing this new phone that we called the Moto X. This is like a really kind of important phone for Motorola, um, because we had just kind of connected with Google in a powerful way. And this was like a pure Android experience. And um, in this phone, we, the, the whole question was, what, what should differentiate this phone? Like what are the key signature experiences that we want to enable? And so what we did is we didn't just talk to all the designers and engineers and all of those folks. 
we actually said, well, why don't we go out and talk to ordinary people who are out in the world who are using, who are going to be using this experience? And, um, and we, the way that we did that is we created this whole modeling toolkit. We actually use foam core. What I'm going to do, this is, keeps crashing when I play, so what I'm going to try to do instead is um, just see if I can show you this view. Oh, geez, this is great. Thanks, Keynote. <laughs> so um, let me describe a little bit of what we did here. All right, any technical experts in the room that can... Or Paul, any, do you have a lightning dongle that I might be able to present off of this? Oh, give me one second to uh, actually get my laptop. I think that'll be a bit more stable. So what we ended up doing was creating... Um, so how many of you guys have worked with foam core? in any projects. It's this really lightweight material, but it has rigidity. And we, we ended up creating all these different little squares of foam core at different sizes. So you had one that was as small that could be like a wearable, and we created some that were as large as you could actually make a whole kind of flat panel display. And the whole idea there is we went into people's homes and we learned about their lives, and then we said, okay, imagine five years in the future. What does that start to feel like? What does that look like? And they had a really hard time at first when you guys were saying, oh my God, when I ask you to draw, imagine you're in your home and some, you know, somebody comes in and says, let's think about the future. <laughs> and so what we did is we actually brought in some improv coaches who are really good at bringing people's creativity out. And we got these folks into a place where they can just start talking about you know, what they hoped from the future. And we wanted it to be in their native habitat. Because if you're in a focus group session and you're trying to imagine a, a morning routine, that's kind of hard. But if, if you're like lying kind of on your bed and you're kind of like thinking about that, like you, you notice people and relationships and things in new ways. So we had this gentleman, for example, who was you know, super nerd. He was selling sensors. He, he, he said, I don't have a creative bone in my body. But he was like, you know, when I think about dinner, it's a big frustration point. You know, I, it's something crazy like 60% of households have no idea what they're eating for dinner by 4 o'clock. How many of you guys know what you're having for dinner tonight already? Right? See? Like, we don't know. And it's like there's a lot of stress at like 5.52 when we get hungry. So he said, you know, what if I had a tablet on my fridge that was digital, it was connected, if I had something to my shopping list, I could write it down. It would get synced to my wife's phone. And when she's near a grocery, she can just pick up the milk and eggs. It could also give me recipe ideas, right? So it was really interesting um, to go into these people's homes and just for half an hour, we had them walk through their lives, but just better in the future. And uh, like, you know, we had, we had these wearables. We had all, you know, and, and a lot of in these scenarios, people were just talking. To devices. You can see these are all the different squares back here as an example of that toolkit. And so this woman, Jenny, every day she got home half an hour before her husband. And her first thing that she would do is she would turn on the TV. And she and her husband didn't always have the same plan on where to leave the remote. So she often <laughs> her friction is like, well, I, I don't even know where this thing is. What I want to do is just like walk in. And wouldn't it be cool if my TV just said, welcome home, Jenny. <laughs> do you want to turn on the news like you always do? And she'd be like, yes. Great. Right. So we saw this whole pattern and we started like visualizing these stories and, and, and doing different scenarios about how could people just or talk to stuff. And when the engineering team saw this, this idea that came from our customers, our users, they said, you know, well, we have this really low power chip on the Moto X and we didn't really know what to use it for. We thought we might use it for email, but actually we could use that chip to always listen for the right kind of trigger word. In our case, it was Hey Moto so that you don't have to like press a button, swipe to unlock, use face recognition, and then like ask, right? And so that idea became the signature focus. We created touchless control, and that was the most loved feature of this device. And it didn't come from cool designers. It came from involving, collaborating with ordinary people in the process. Now, this sounds like an obvious idea, but six years ago, we didn't have Echo and Alexa. We didn't have Google Home. Siri hadn't been announced yet. And what I'm so proud of is that our team did the first implementation of speaking to a bit of technology and having it respond outside of science fiction. Because we've seen it in Star Trek, we've seen it in science fiction movies. This is the first time we did it for real. And to me, this is the power 
of collaborative co-creation design tools. And when you have the mentality that everybody is creative and can participate in the process, you can get these kind of ideas out. Okay, so time for one more example. Okay. So Google ended up buying Motorola, which is kind of amazing. A 19-year-old company buying a 97-year-old company. Um, and when, they, when, when that happened, they actually brought in uh, Dr. Regina Dugan from DARPA. Now, the DARPA is the U.S. military's advanced research projects agency. And I wasn't really down with that whole thing. But DARPA's culture is one of um, really rapid experimentation and innovation. Like, raise your hands if you've used GPS to navigate in the last day or two. Yeah, GPS, DARPA. Raise your hand if you've used the internet in some form in the last 30 seconds. Yeah? <laughs> the ARPANET, from, you know, predecessor of the internet, that's DARPA. You know, micro MEMS, um, 3D printing, I mean, all of those things actually came from this group. And so I was privileged enough to be the first person from Motorola to work for her team, and she actually gives this great TED talk about um, how to do these amazing things. And you start with the question, what would you do if you knew that you couldn't fail? What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And it's so interesting, because if you think about that drawing activity we just did, she's kind of asking you to get out of that fear immediately. And just, let's, let's imagine there's no failure. What would you do? And so when she asked me that question, I said, well, you know, as a designer, you know, I like Johnny Ive and Apple, but this was the iPhone 5 had just come out. And you look at these videos, and he's talking about, you know, we, we check 752 inlays to make the perfect alignment between no gaps. And it's, it's like, this is like in, you know, industrial era um, fascination, right? Like Henry Ford is like delightful in the next world to see Johnny Ive, <laughs> you know, taking the notion of the assembly line to such extremity. But the whole idea of the iPhone and of hardware in general is let's make one thing exactly the same a million times. But if you think about our innate creativity, what if we ask the opposite question? What if you could make a million things only once? That's perfect for you. So we, that was the question that we started with. And so, because I, I had been to Maker Fair. Uh, have any of you guys ever been to a Maker Fair anywhere? These things are, it's, it's a community of folks that comes together and teaches each other knowledge about how to make stuff. And this is kind of cool because you see collective creativity at its best. And I wanted to kind of use this metaphor, like, you know, how many of you guys have ever created an app, a mobile app for any iPhone? Yeah. How many of you know someone who's created an app in the last year? Yeah. Like, creating software on this thing is easy, but hardware is really difficult. And so, we actually started this project where we, we created um, the right kind of hardware conditions to create a prototype. We went to Berkeley. Um, into the university world, we went to this class of mechanical engineers and said, hey, here's a phone that you can hack in a positive way. And do something awesome about with this in terms of music. And so we had all kinds of things. But this team, they actually had this incredible phone that they showed us that they, you know, they, they were like, all right, here we go. I'm going to turn it on. And they hit the button, and there was dead silence. And I was so embarrassed for these guys because they worked so hard until they started turning their phone, and all of a sudden you would see smiles going across the room because what they were doing was beamforming Beyonce to a, you know, a two by two foot box. And they, were, they had great delight in testing this with their professors because the professors up here lecturing and the back of the class is just like jamming and no one can hear except for them. And we were just like blown away by the creativity when people are given the tools to make. And so Regina said, okay, we gotta test this more. And we had to create a hardware development toolkit, which in our case is a Mercedes Sprinter van wrapped in 4,000 linear feet of Velcro, because Velcro is awesome. You can stick anything to it. You can change the design anytime. It's like modular hardware. And uh, the only way that I got to go on this trip, by the way, because I had three children at the time, was to convince my wife that this would be a father-son epic road trip <laughs> with my 14-year-old. <laughs> so sometimes you got to be creative in these things. So we ended up driving. Um, you know, 14,002 miles across the country and rocking up at different maker spaces and universities, public libraries. And we would open up this truck and we had hardware and software and 3D printing. And in the first kind of 20 minutes, we would have people brainstorm about what they wanted to see in the world. People would team up around cool ideas. Then we'd say, all right, you've got 24 hours to make it. Let's go, right? So getting people into that creative zone. And, you know, one of the first teams took 
this glo work glove off the back of the truck and flex sensors and capacitive pads. And within a day, they had created this glove that was translating American Sign Language into text messages. Which, I mean, that was kind of amazing. Motorola designers and Google folks wouldn't have really thought about that. We had another team that said, well, there's 150 million children every year that have eye issues that go undiagnosed because there's not enough eye doctors in the world. So they created this thing where a smartphone could have a couple extra sensors and essentially become a portable eye doctor to at least diagnose basic eye issues. Again, holy crap, like that's really amazing. We had this team at MIT, this guy had gotten hit by a bicyclist behind him because the bicyclist didn't realize he was putting his brakes on. So he said, you know, I need to have brake lights. So he made a, a helmet that red lights would turn on when the accelerometer would feel that he was slowing down. They raised a million dollars on Kickstarter for this thing. And actually this thing was just got picked up at the Apple store and it's in their, in their second iteration. So proud of this team that kind of took this to the next level. So we saw this team after team after team. Now think about this from a business perspective. You don't normally collaborate with these kind of people. These are users, they're recipients of your organization's creativity. But this is what can happen when you involve everyday people in your process. And over the next little while, we said, well, let's create something that can bring that out. So we actually launched what we called Project Aura, which was Google's modular phone. And this was kind of like if Lego and a smartphone had a child, it would be Project Aura. Like you could create pieces and parts. If something breaks, you don't have to throw out your phone. You swap in a new part. If you're going on a trip, you put in the higher end camera. If you need more battery life, you can pop that in. How many of you guys still want a keyboard from the Blackberry days? Not many, but if you did, you could swap one in, right? And throughout this journey, we used actually uh, this tool called D-Scout. Design Scout was the name. And the idea was that you can, anyone in the world can contribute to your project. You don't have to be with them. And we had, we launched what we called a mission. We asked people about, tell us about the ideal size of your phone. These were the submissions in the first 72 hours from around the world. We were shocked. I had to hire three data scientists to actually even process the, the flood of input. And we had people sending all kinds of things. Even like we had people create the perfect size phone for them and take the dimensions and send those to us. And the actual engineering dimensions of the frame that we created were based off of 34,000 crowdsourced measurements of people from around the world, which is pretty, pretty amazing. We even hired one of this, this engineer from LA who had like very technical radio diagrams of like how to do modular phones. Um, so this is kind of what happens when you treat the world as your team. Incredibly powerful ideas come. Now, Google ended up shutting down Project Aura because Regina left for Facebook. It lost its executive sponsor and the new executive, it just wasn't a priority. But Motorola ended up actually creating the Moto Z. And this phone actually was pretty successful. It's now in its third generation. This is a phone where you can create, um, you can put in any, uh, only one module at a time, but a camera or a game controller or kind of a VR kind of uh, experience. And so to me, it just proves that sometimes the creative ideas you get when you collaborate at this level are wild and crazy and you may never build, but sometimes you won't get these ideas that are buildable if you don't try and stretch beyond. So those are, that's just a little taste from kind of a commercial perspective and a hardware and tech perspective of what can happen. It makes me wonder, what would happen if I worked at a nonprofit? What, what would happen if I thought about kind of a social organization that was trying to have impact? And in many ways, I think many of you are probably doing some of these things, involving people in your process. Um, but it gives me great hope that if we think about human beings not as just consumers or users or recipients of other people's great ideas, but we think about them as innately as creators, some pretty amazing things happen. And I was thinking about this word tool, because tool is, is like, you know, has a couple of meanings. Number one is, it's something that you use to accomplish a job, or this is the human notion of it. You know, this is someone who is used by other people and usually doesn't even realize it. <laughs> like some people might say that I'm a tool of this eyeglass company because I'm, be, I, you know, I'm ridiculous and they're using me as a tool. But what I actually think is so cool about this from a design perspective and maybe from your worlds is that I have another definition. It's somebody who's used by other people and realize that this is awesome. This is why we were created. 
we were meant to serve. And if we take our most egotistical professions of design and strategy and innovation and use it as a tool for people and really involve them in the process, amazing things can happen. Thank you so much. Thank you.